Um, I also would like to thank my dissertation committee, uh, particularly Sven Hawkinson, who I don't think has made it in yet, but hopefully he will when he can watch the video. Uh, the rest of the committee, uh, I think, may be watching online as well. Um, and um, for, all of, for all of their support throughout this project, uh, I especially want to thank everyone who I worked with on this project, uh, from my colleagues at the road, in, um, the road to Housing and All Home, to the advocates such as Bill Curlin Hackett, who's here, and Gene Darcy, uh, as well as uh, uh, Catherine, who I worked with at Seattle University in the Vehicle Residency Research Program, um, as well as the parking enforcement officers who aren't here, who shared their difficult work with me and with you today. And most importantly, I thank you, the people who live in their vehicles throughout Seattle and beyond, who gave their time, their knowledge, and their life stories for this project so that they may teach others about the world that we share. I'll begin this presentation with a little background on vehicle residency. Uh, I'll then introduce you to two field sites and discuss the methods that I use to research and tell this story. Throughout this presentation, also, hi, Michelle. Uh, throughout this presentation, I'll show some of my findings, my thesis, and the hypothesis about the future of what may be a future of vehicle residency in the United States, and a little bit about uh, on, theory, on theory and archaeological analogy. Come on in. Um, this study is, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep this part about the theory and analogy brief uh, and simple, but it is, uh, please bear with me because it is important. Uh, this study is rooted in ethnoarchaeology. Uh, or the use of archaeological methods to understand contemporary behaviors and to provide analogy to similar behaviors in the past and present. My goal is to challenge possible assumptions about why people live in vehicles, to show how people use mobile shelters to navigate their environment, and offer suggestions for including vehicle residency into our social services. If I can provide any clarification on anything throughout the presentation, let me know, and I'll try to sleep, speak as slowly as possible. I know I speak quickly, I apologize. <laughs> I haven't had caffeine, I promise. Um, otherwise, please write down any questions you may, or ideas you may have for our discussion at the end. Uh, we're gonna have a lot to cover. This is eight years of research that I'm gonna be going up, and this could be about six different presentations, so I'm, about, I'm gonna put it all into one. Um, but I wanna have enough time for everyone's presentation, or everyone's questions, so let's begin. So the next two slides are the only fo that focus on the academic details of my research. I'll get into some of the findings, but I'll try to make this part quick so that we can drop the jargon and return to the presentation. And I hope to show that vehicle residency, uh, I hope to show vehicle residency through this theoretical framework and how, so that it can help explain some of the causes and effects of inhabiting a vehicle in public space. So two basic theories emerged from this research and would help to guide its analysis. First, human behavioral ecology describes the many ways that human actions are adaptations to our social and biological environment. Contrary to the strong sociobiological thesis that would correlate, uh, directly correlate human genetics and behavior, in contrast to that, what I follow here is what's called a weak sociobiological thesis that human behavior tends to be adaptive to our social and biological environments of human evolution. This theoretical frame helped me to understand the behavior of mobile sheltering as a personally optimal adaptive response to persistent sociobiological environment of displacement. The forces of displacement can be personal, such as a need for inaccessible social, medical, or mental health care, or people may mobilize for structural reasons, such as unemployment, housing unaffordability, eviction, as well as law enforcement sweeps of legal warnings, tickets, and impounds. This leads to the second theoretical frame, what Robbie McVeigh termed as, this is a jargony, a sedentarist hegemony. And he, he based this on his ethnographic research with Irish and British <coughs> travelers in the 1990s. McVeigh argues that settled cultures seek to reinforce their sedentary cultural norms and ideals through this hegemony. And that the, uh, a hegemony is the set of sort of cultural uh, norms by which a person is defined as being a good person. Right, by living up to these things. Go on. Oh. I'm not sure if they'll come in. Maybe they'll come back. <laughs> oh, they're Hi, Sven. Um, McVeigh's sedentarism is the structural violence produced by sedentism, where, a st where settled societies reinforce their sedentary ideals by alienating and eliminating nomadic behavior as an outsider threat. Now, there's a tension between how these theories frame vehicle residency. On one hand, 
people are using vehicles as affordable housing where it is otherwise unavailable. On the other hand, the reliance on a mobile shelter our mobile sheltering behavior exposes people to anti-nomadic structural violence, such as legal harassment and banishment from public space. The majority of the people that I met in this research were raised in our contemporary settled society, yet they relied on a behavior of mobile sheltering to secure personal stability and access a familiar network of local services, local resources. They were not inherent nomads fueled on wanderlust, these were people who did not have the resources to inhabit private space in their historic community. In this way, vehicle residency may offer an analogy for other so-called nomadic people in the past and present. The role of social forces of displacement is vital to understanding uh, the initial dispossession of land, as well as the ongoing transiency of mobilized people. Indeed, we should question how the label of nomad itself renders persistent displacement and alienation as somehow inherent to a person. I suggest that evidence of mobile sheltering in the contemporary and in the archaeological record may show, an optima, may show evidence of an optimal uh, adaptive strategy to historic, social, and structural forces of, display, of dispossession, displacement, and alienation. Furthermore, the tendency of settled communities to diagnose perceived nomadic behaviors as diseased and foreign, dismisses the structural causes of displacement. My research focuses on how the implicit and explicit bias against so-called nomadism acts as a barrier to including perceived nomadic shelters, such as vehicle residencies, within official emergency shelter systems. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we made it. <laughs> Um, this next slide, uh, I'm going to go through briefly, really quickly. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Methods are very, very important. Uh, but if you have more questions on this, please ask at the end. I'd be happy to talk more about them. Um, I applied a four-field approach to this study, uh, I tend to do, uh, combining methods from sociocultural, linguistic, and biological anthropology, as well as ethnoarchaeology. I began this research uh, by uh, purchasing an RV and sleeping on public streets in it for one week a month over five months. Uh, and uh, worked for the Road to Housing program for two years as the primary outreach provider for around 1,500 to 2,000 vehicle residents in Seattle. Uh, served on the executive and governing board of All Home, our uh, regional uh, social service oversight agency. Um, I'm in the process of doing a critical discourse analysis of 500 media articles around from across the country about vehicle residency to understand sort of the cultural narrative of vehicle residency and how that's been developing throughout our country. Uh, I've done extensive photography as well as analysis of the effects of vehicle residency on diet and health. And as a whole, I'm really looking at this, this study and how we can better help people living in vehicles connect with medical and social service systems. Uh, and then I did an extensive mapping of, um, of vehicle resident settlement patterns uh, throughout Seattle. I'll talk about all of these uh, as we get through them. So I began this research with two basic questions. First off, start with the basics. What is vehicle residency? It's an easy one to start with. The second question, a little more deep, is what can vehicle residency tell us about contemporary and past use of mobile shelters? And I chose these questions to offer some basic definitions and tools for future research, as well as to unpack some of the deeper issues around mobile sheltering, displacement, and resettlement. Considering vehicle residency as a mobile sheltering pattern connects this local contemporary phenomena with a human history of adaptive response to environmental displacement. For example, let's, consider vehicle, let's compare vehicle residency in Seattle with the Irish and British travelers. The Travelers are a com community that was initially displaced around 400 years ago by the Bri British colonization of Ireland, as well as the enclosure of commonly held lands and subsequent evictions. Throughout the next four centuries, the population of, this population of internally displaced people grew due to conflict, famine, and further evictions. <coughs> you can see this first picture, they, you can see people in a caravan or bardo and what's called a bender tent. They survived in public spaces using these mobile shelters. They carry their lives with them in their, limited space, uh, in their limited spaces. They created capital from recycling the scrap produced by settled communities. And they developed their own settlement sites on the peripheries of communities until they were forced to move along. All of these are adaptive responses to environmental forces and all familiar to vehicle residents in Seattle. 
The British and Irish governments have been working since the 1960s to settle this itinerant group, but with mixed success. And I'll return to this analogy in the conclusion, but I think we should consider how we may view these and the further photographs in my research through different views. For example, what may appear as refuse is often makeshift shelters. You see here, this may look like a pile of garbage, but you look again, you can see this is one of these vendor tents, and it's been covered in, in oil cloth to keep it dry. Uh, people's bikes, whether they're using for uh, transportation, uh, extra wagon wheel. You can see all of this is part of this, this settlement. This is, none of this is garbage. Uh, same here, we can see these piles that may at first glance look like garbage, but these really are actually recycling piles. They're scrap piles of different types of metal. Uh, and, and for people who have worked with vehicle residents, I would, would uh, think about how many times we've seen similar things just like this. And you'll see some photographs later on. I encourage you to think about how we can compare them and think differently about what they <coughs> may represent. Increasingly, though, in the United States, people are using vehicle residency to navigate persistent forces of displacement, whether this is the campfire, this is a picture from just about a month ago, less than a month ago, uh, the recent campfires in California when people were uh, lost their housing, uh, many moved into local Walmart parking lots and vehicles before they were evicted from those parking lots when rains came in because they didn't have the infrastructure uh, because of the public health issues about many people living in these parking lots. So people turn to these, uh, these vehicle residency from natural disaster to economic barriers and opportunities, such as migrant workforce that works with the second largest employer in the country, Amazon.com, you probably don't heard of that. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the camper force. Has anybody ever heard of camper force? It's a pretty interesting project. Uh, I've known people in vehicles living here in Seattle who live in uh, Seattle during the summer and commute out for Camper Force in the winter. Uh, Camper Force is a large, uh, they have large RV parks set up in Tennessee and North Carolina where people will travel out there to work seasonally in the shipping uh, um, distribution centers for Amazon. Um, this can be for social exclusion. Uh, in, uh, in 2014, the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty found that the tr the found, uh, released a report that the trendiest law in America may be a ban on sleeping in cars. Mm. I think they found that in the last 10 years, there was a 113% increase in laws around vehicle residency. But more and more Americans are turning towards vehicle residency, sometimes referred to as van life or RV life as a new way of affordable housing. This was uh, just this last summer, 2018, CBS Money Watch put out an, an interesting article about vehicle residency, actually using the term, uh, where they reported that there's been an increase of over 46% of the number of people living in vehicles from the last year. Uh, so this is by no, no means a localized issue. This is vehicle residency uh, is uh, a way of housing for people across the country. For some, it's a last resort. For some, it's a form of migrant labor. For others, or it's a tool for migrant labor, for others it could be a step up from living on the streets to living between public and private space. So what is vehicle residency? So to be clear, what is? To be clear, there is a difference in the quality of life and resources available to various forms of vehicle residency. In many ways, in many important ways, the RVing retiree snowbirds studied by Dorothy and David Counts, experience a very different life from other vehicle residents who inhabit public space. The primary distinction between these is the possession of a permanent piece of property. Thus, the endless vacations of RVing seniors can be differentiated from the reliance on mobile sheltering by displaced people, be they Irish or British travelers who inhabit caravans and settled halting sites that we'll talk about, uh, as studied by George Gamelch, or Americans who inhabit cars in public parking or off street spaces as studied by Cindy Mendoza and Michelle Wagan. Despite these differences, during their, the annual nationwide point in time count of unsheltered people, any vehicle that is occupied in public parking may be reported as a quote, place unfit for human habitation with an unknown number of quote, homeless occupants. And I use those quotes because many people living in their vehicles uh, consider these as homes. I don't even want to really get in that because I think we should just start with that. I think that should be a basic assumption. Anyone who's lived in a, a shelter for 20 years often considers that a home. Like the label of homeless, vehicle residency should not be seen as a master identity that defines a person. Rather, vehicle residency is an action that can be temporary or long-term. Simply put, vehicle residency is the habitation of an automobile as a primary shelter. 
and my research focuses on vehicle residency in public and off-street parking in Seattle. So I focused on Seattle because, well, it's home, and <laughs> it's right here. Um, I also uh, had been uh, living and working in Ballard for many years uh, and had known many customers uh, who uh, were living in their vehicles, who worked full-time jobs, who you know, maintained regular hygiene patterns and definitely did not consider themselves homeless, uh, but often reported this uh, discrimination that they experienced upon uh, this connection with their vehicle. Well, Seattle and the surrounding region have experienced several technology and labor market shifts since its colonization by American and European immigrants in the 1850s. When times were booming, Seattle's, Seattle's residents faced rising housing and living costs that led to gentrification and displacement from the city. When times were hard, they faced a hollowed out unemployment market that often favored jobs which had left the city, like when Boeing shifted a lot of uh, manufacturing in the 1970s. Uh, this is, I, I want to take a moment on this photo. I love this photo here. Uh, this, uh, there's several uh, kind of uh, famous photos of the Hoovervilles in Seattle. There's one that kind of shows the Hooverville looking um, north towards the, the Smith Tower. This is another photo of shack towns, which are similar to Hoovervilles. At this time, when this photo was taken in 1938, there was a census that reported 22,000 shacks in, in, throughout Seattle. It's important to kind of keep uh, this issue in perspective. At this time, right now, um, in 2018, uh, there are roughly 540,000 people who are experiencing homelessness in the United States. Can anybody correct me on that number? I think that's, I think that's roughly about right. At this time, there were roughly 2 million people who were experiencing homelessness. And it's not to dismiss or, 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 or to, to lower the, the, the importance of the issue that's before us, but to remind us that as a society, we have helped settle people before in our community. Uh, this picture I find particularly interesting because this shack town right here is an interbay, right? This is the interbay rail line. This is Queen Anne. This is looking north, Ballard over here. And this is actually where one of the safe parking lots zones was, interestingly okay. enough. So we're going to come back to that, but I, I really like that photo because that's actually where I did a lot of my research at. So I started looking at... Uh, at vehicle residency in 2010, shortly after the Great Recession and at the start of another economic boom in Seattle. And I, again, I was focused on, on Ballard uh, because I had lived and worked alongside many vehicle residents there for years. I started look, um, this map was provided by the Department of Transportation in 2012 and shows the placement of no parking two to five a.m. signs throughout Ballard. Uh, this was, uh, this. These two maps were provided together. And something you notice on this is you see kind of the darker area here. This is the industrial zone, right, which matches this industrial zone right here. Uh, and these red dots are the placement of no parking 2 to 5 a.m. signs. Now, I uh, highlight the, where the placement of these are around the area and the clustering of these no parking 2 to 5 a.m. signs. When we draw a circle around these, we can see the historic locations of vehicle residency settlement encampments as well as places that have since been banished for vehicle residency. So because of these no parking 2 to 5 a.m. signs, they're effectively no longer uh, available for people to sleep on. Uh, these signs, this was made in 2000. Uh, I'm working to get an updated map of these signs, uh, but I've seen uh, many more installed myself and I've heard some reports of there being up to triple the amount of these signs uh, since 2012, but I'm currently waiting to see the updated maps to substantiate that, so we'll, we'll see what that actually is. But, those advocates who know, know that there, while it was said there was going to be a moratorium on the placement of these signs, there certainly was not a moratorium on these signs. There are more of these signs. So, the data. For over a decade, vehicle residency has represented at least 30% of the King County's total unsheltered population. This year in King County, over half of the people, 53%, who sleep in public space inhabit vehicles. The most recent reports from U.S. Uh, HUD Regional Oversight Agency, All Home, shows that around 125 fewer people slept in vehicles than the 3,500 people who slept in emergency shelters. King County's emergency shelter system received $31 million in funding. Mm. Vehicle residency-oriented programs have seen $350,000 in funding at most. We should ask, why is it that over half the people who sleep in public space throughout King County receive almost no funding, no advocacy, and very little advocacy, except for the people in this room, I want to recognize, and, and very little specific assistance to help them stabilize? 
Moreover, why do we target this growing population of vehicle residents with open legal discrimination and exclusion? I focus on this issue in my dissertation as disaffiliation, or the social exclusion of people based on a perceived behavior, in this case, mobile sheltering. Well, some folks, uh, we, I wanna focus a bit on the community here. Some folks occupy public parking temporarily in long haul com commercial trucks or rented RVs for tourism. Some in vans or older RVs as permanent housing. But all of these vehicles compete with local businesses for a limited pool of parking. And, and what happens is, is that it, it forces people into these same areas and creates these disparate communities. And we see these increasing densities within these areas of people who are forced by law or legally constrained to occupy these spaces. And this is a great example. Here's a, a photo. This, you know, this RV might be a $50,000 RV. These are probably $500 to $5,000 RVs, and we've got a $500 to $5,000 this is really common, that you see people who are kind of forced into these spaces, and they may have nothing to do with each other, but legally, this is the only space for these vehicles to actually park in our cities. And what it's important to note is that this pits this population not only against each other in this competition for this legal resource, this limited resource, but against the settled and business community, which have considerable constituent influence over their local politicians, and who then called in law enforcement to remove these perceived nomads. But the reality is, is that these are often individuals and families who are looking for stability, looking for a home for their mobile home. And uh, here we see one example of Russ and Nikki, who are trying to find someone who, who will allow them to rent a space for their RV for their two boys, 14 and 10, who are in Ottawa, Eugene County. We met while they were having a barbecue on the street. That was a good time. Over half the people who are unsheltered in King County inhabit vehicles, and yet there are few programs that provide parking for vehicle homes to connect their inhabitants with local social welfare system or care. And this is the story, this, uh, it's a difficult slide for me to get through, uh, but it is the story of why I personally ended my work in outreach and why I began the search for a more systemic approach to find space for vehicle residents. In 2015, uh, I was working as the outreach provider for the Road to Housing program. Uh, a lot of the work that I would do when during my outreach was based upon referrals with the Seattle parking, uh, Police Department for Parking Enforcement Division. Uh, often city council members or the complaint line would receive a complaint, the parking enforcement would ask me to come in and make contact with vehicles to do outreach, which really meant to move these people along. That didn't sit well with me, and was one of the reasons why I was deeply conflicted. Um, I did outreach to these vehicles and was able to make contact with the two vehicles on the right, um, with the, of the occupants of them, but not with the vehicle on the left. I knew who, who it was owned by. The RV was owned by a man named Michael, who came to our uh, community meal under the local bridge. Uh, in the Ballard Bridge, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for our, the Stone Soup Group. And um, Michael, uh, I, I told the police that we knew Michael and that I'm sure that we could find him, um, that I'm sure there just must be some, some small issue. Uh, over two months, I attempted to find Michael. We returned every couple of weeks to his van or to his RV to, to make contact, uh, sending messages to the police not to impound his vehicle. But after two months, uh, they, I received a message that they were going to be impounding the vehicle. So I came down, actually I let my mutual friend Jen, uh, several people in this room know, uh, come down to, um, I let her know about this and she got there before I did as the tow truck was actually towing the, 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 the RV away. She talked to the tow truck driver into dropping the RV off uh, the truck and inside um, she found uh, Michael Franklin deceased. Um, mm -hmm. And he had likely been deceased in the vehicle for about three months, um, probably for a month before I began doing the outreach because that's how long the vehicle had been complained that it hadn't moved. Um, during that time, uh, during that two months of outreach, as I was knocking right here on this window from about six inches from Michael, uh, about 100,000 people drove by on this busy arterial road. Well, this is Leary Way. This is a very busy road. 
And uh, I share this story because, well, first off, for me, it made me realize that while I couldn't necessarily help Michael, and I, and, and I couldn't necessarily have stopped what, what, and what led to his life, we can offer a better life for Michael. We can offer a space for his home. And at the very best, to the very least, we can offer him a better death. In the end, um, his vehicle was towed away. There was no real obituary, no real service, no um, remembrance at all. Um, I hope that this can be one for him. These vehicles, for many, are forms of this adaptive response. They're uh, this adaptive response to these environmental conditions. They are forms of resilience and resistance, despite this displacement. We see uh, one example of this with Bangarang Village, uh, which was actually just right down the street uh, on North Quake Lay. Um, this is where a community of uh, former U, uh, University Avenue street kids, actually, and many of them were kids who were uh, part of protests on the Ave. Um, they moved into vehicles, RVs, as their first forms of home ownership. Um, they uh, were trying to establish a community, and they said that they weren't going to move anymore. And they just started to stay on this place for about two months uh, until communities rose up and uh, the police ended up actually towing all of these vehicles to a distant um, industrial zone. And what happens is, is that, you know, again, we see these dense uh, groupings occur of these vehicles. But, but I want, one, one of the things I want to point out in this picture is, uh, this is in Soto. Um, Thinking back to the photo that we saw earlier of the tank of the travelers, right? And when we look at the, the objects that people have, at first glance, it, it, I think a lot of our tendency is to see kind of just garbage or, or, or stuff, right? Hoarding, all this stuff. But when we look at what we have, I mean, we have children's bikes, we have materials that could be used for work, we have, you know, someone's probably, this is probably their, their own bike for travel. I mean, virtually everything here has value and, and is, 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 is of use to this person. Um, and I, I, I show that because I think this is part of, of what I want to get at is why do we automatically see these things as garbage? Finally, um, vehicle residents uh, are often, uh, uh, they know better than anyone about what they're experiencing here. Uh, this photo uh, is uh, uh, from a bus, uh, Pax. Uh, this was a flyer that was being handed out for a long time. I don't know if you guys can read it in the back, but it says, uh, in Seattle, 776 people sleep in their vehicles. That was about half, it was inaccurate. Uh, but 776 people sleep in their vehicles. An average one bedroom rent is $1,500 a month. As you know, I think that's up to $2,000 right now. Uh, and of course, the number of people sleeping in their vehicles in Seattle is maybe three times that. And one of the reasons why I show this is because um, I don't want to act like an authority on the subject. The people who experience vehicle residency uh, you know, are people who just like everybody. And they know their situation like anybody knows their situation. The language that, that I'm using of this kind of settled community of the nomads and this discrimination and displacement, these come from the people I've worked with, that, that people say these things, right? People talk about the displacement about the fact that housing is too high, that this is a form of affordable housing. And I found that really interesting that um, that uh, people who are living in, again, people living in their vehicles often did not see themselves as homeless and directly contested sort of that uh, ideas around what it means to be homeless. So through this research, I found at least five laws that weave together uh, to disproportionately affect vehicle <coughs> residents. Uh, which Seattle University Homeless Rights Project uh, reported as prohibitive and proscriptive ordinance. They wrote a great report if you have an opportunity to see it. At face value, these laws may seem reasonable and pragmatic, such as restricting oversized vehicles from parking overnight on residential streets uh, ensures the easy access for emergency vehicles at night. Makes sense. However, together these laws force people who sleep in vehicles to occupy the most industrially polluted, unpoliced and resource deficient places in our communities, particularly those who live in oversized vehicles such as RVs and buses, which are up to half of vehicle residencies in Seattle. In, the few re in these few remaining legal spaces, <clears throat> consistent waves of warnings and tickets further destabilize vehicle residents, contributing to their property loss and mental trauma. 
Seattle University and the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty have reported that this legal policy of endlessly enforced internal migration of vehicle homes is common throughout cities in the United States. Ultimately, this hostile environment towards vehicle residents increases law enforcement cost and the difficulty for social service outreach providers to maintain the necessary contact with people that they need to help them get into housing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> to better understand the realities of vehicle residents in, in Seattle, I conducted three years of mapping uh, the parking of vehicle homes in public space. Uh, I did this, uh, I did not collect license plate information when I was doing that or any kind of identifying information on the vehicle and studied areas that specifically were, were reported to us by the parking enforcement uh, as a place of high vehicle residency. And I did this specifically to protect the privacy, the safety of vehicle residents, as well as to not alert police to hidden locations of vehicle residents. Uh, this is sort of a process that we did. We spent uh, had three for over three years, had three different teams conducting uh, eight weeks each of settlement and mapping. Uh, at Seattle University was part of it for two years. Um, and we did this for two reasons. The first was that at the time, uh, there was no actual method for documenting vehicles. So the, the one night count really didn't have a standardized process. Uh, when I went on the, the one night count myself, I was told look for vehicles with uh, condensation in the windows, which is kind of ridiculous uh, if you think about it. Because if you've done the one night count, I think people are laughing at the count. Uh, the count is done on, on the last Thursday of January uh, at 2 a.m. Virtually every vehicle has condensation to windows at that time. So, uh, so the first thing was to develop an actual responsive method, responsible method for documenting vehicles on uh, these counts. The second was to record the number and type of vehicle residencies and see if there was a correlation between this and law. <coughs> so when we compare the legal restrictions on the space, as we talked about before, we can see how dense settlements develop within this overnight parking. So this is the GIS map. This is taking all that information and putting it together into averages. And what we can see here is that uh, this, this kind of pinkish area is again that industrial zone that we saw earlier on the, the map of Ballard. And this yellow is where the no parking two to five AM signs were at that time. Uh, again, this, is in, this was back in 2012, so the, this, this, there's considerable um, increase in this. But what we notice, if we look at the location, oh, I should notice the red lines, the, the thicker the line is the greater the density of vehicle resident settlements in there. You can see how they correlate to the numbers here. If we look at where the placement of these are, we can see that these are, are virtually islands of safety within this sea of restrictions. Right? And again, since this point, these restrictions have, have gone far up. In fact, there's few places where you can actually park in this area now in Ballard if you're in an RV overnight. So what happens is that these laws constraining the overnight parking for vehicle residency alongside with this consistent growth of the vehicle resident population have created these increasingly dense settlement patterns that have led to community complaints. Such as the Magnolia meeting, uh, somewhat infamous a couple of years ago, people grumbling in the room have heard of the Magnolia meeting, this was a big one. Uh, at this meeting, uh, people, the people who were running this meeting, which is a group called the NSA, which does not stand for the National Security Administration, this in this case it stands for the Neighborhood Safety Alliance, though I am sure the initials <laughs> was not uh, an accident. Um, they are a sort of, um, outspoken group that uh, wants to eliminate homelessness within our communities, but often by driving homeless people out. Okay, so I, I'm trying to say that in the most positive way. Uh, one of the things they did at this meeting was they handed out uh, bell jars full of syringes while having pictures of RVs on fire and mothers holding their children tight. Okay, so I mean, it, it was um, startling, the use of fear and imagery that was being used to sort of hype up this anti-homeless rhetoric uh, through this meeting. But what's particularly interesting is that this meeting ended with the NSA proposing the creation of the safe lots, uh, which may, some people don't know, but that was actually how the safe zones and some of the safe lots were created in Seattle. Uh, those lots, these are the lots that were often, um, the Yankee Diner is one of them, was often <laughs> cited as being incredibly expensive, and we'll talk about that uh, later. Um, but what's also interesting is that within one month of the creation of those lots, this same NSA started lobbying for the shutdown of those lots, right? Oh, it's really interesting. One of, the, one of the other interesting pieces is that when they proposed to the creation of those lots, they also proposed for an increase in law enforcement to sweep people out of these communities. 
So what they did was they basically created a space where they tried to push everybody in, criminalized the occupation of all the rest of the public space, and then removed that only remaining space. So what that does is it creates these warnings, these suites, these tickets. Uh, here's Jay. Uh, some of us know Jay. It's uh, kind of a famous uh, car rancher, sometimes we refer to. Uh, he and his mother uh, have been homeless for decades uh, and own vehicles all throughout the Puget Sound. Uh, and he actually uses them as, as kind of waypoints. He travels. He uses this uh, as he moves around the area, uh, getting the services that he needs and his mother. And they also rent many of these vehicles out to other people who are experiencing homelessness, uh, who live in the vehicles as shelters. Uh, that's actually really common. It's something that you would be surprised how many times uh, uh, you meet someone uh, in vehicle residency outreach who is not owning the vehicle that they're in, that they may be pay paying $20 a week or so so that they can rent it as a shelter. And all this creates this cycle of structural violence. So what happens is, is that it begins with the habitation of the vehicle to avoid unsheltered homelessness. This leads to this uh, vehicle residency within this limited legal space like we talked about, which then creates this frequent police contact with the vehicle and creates this thing called workflow. And I don't know, has anybody ever heard of workflow? Mm -hmm. uh, the advocates in here now. Workflow is an interesting thing. It's something that it's, it's not, doesn't ever come up in a, in a court of law. It's generally not legally admissible. But what it is is that every time your vehicle, every time a police officer, parking enforcement, or law enforcement officer makes contact with the vehicle, it gets documented. Right? Just a little line that says, oh, I made contact with this vehicle. So what happens is, is that when a police officer, often law, parking enforcement officers are, are surprisingly pretty compassionate about vehicle residency often. It's generally patrol officers who don't have a lot of pr uh, previous history working with people living in vehicles. They will show up based on a complaint. They'll see a line of vehicles and they'll pull up the workflow on all the vehicles. And what they see is that while one of the vehicles might have been the source of the complaint, they'll find this long workflow on all the vehicles because they've been living in this area for months. So the officer will say, oh, these people don't care about living in the community, ticket everybody and move everybody. So this is something you see a lot is that people kind of get swept up in these group kind of communal actions that are often only against one person. Oops, going backwards. Um, this creates parking tickets, which then leads to the denial of registration tabs due to these unpaid tickets. And has anybody ever had their tabs expire? <laughs> so you know what happens when you have your tabs expire, right? It's ticket, 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 ticket. And that leads to uh, what is called scoff law. And in 2011, uh, the city of Seattle uh, created a scoff law law and a scoff law unit, uh, which basically what it says is, is that if your vehicle has uh, uh, three tickets that are in collections for more than 90 days, it can be immediately booted with that big mechanical boot that we all see and love. Uh, and once that boot is put on, you have 48 hours to pay all of the fines, all the collection fees, the boot fee, which is about $150, $200. Uh, generally, it ends up being about $1,000 to $2,000, depending upon the fines you may have. If you are unable to pay all of that within 48 hours, the vehicle is impounded and sold to collect those fees. And you can imagine if, if an RV is only being sold for a couple hundred dollars or one dollar, which is the going rate right now uh, for RVs at, at um, auction sales, they are reclaiming the money. Um, but then what happens is the vehicle is impounded, which then leads to back to the slots of shelter. Obviously, this is full of harm because it's a horrible situation. But what's really interesting about this, and one of the things I want to point out, is that almost all of this goes away the moment the vehicle is out of public space. This almost all of this occurs because the vehicle is in public parking, which brings me to the next point: <coughs> vehicle residency and off-street parking. In 2012, I worked with several vehicle resident advocates, several of which are, are here in this room, uh, to develop the first safe parking program in Seattle, what became known as the Road to Housing Program. I worked as the outreach specialist for this program from 2013 to 2015, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, and uh, the Road to Housing program, though, ended in 2018 when its coordinating nonprofit declined to continue their contract. The low total number of people who exited their vehicles and the unnecessarily high cost for some of the uh, overloaded pilot programs that we talked about, uh, particularly uh, specifically due to requirements for 24-hour security, which I think is 
crazy. Um, uh, that those because of those those costs that, that these that the program has been consistently cited as uh, uh, I'm sorry the, the costs and the low number of people exiting have been consistently cited as evidence for the program's failure. In 2013, however, the Road to Housing program provided parking for 52 individuals and families, and of these, helped 34 of these people enter stable shelter. So if we compare the rate of moving people into stable shelter from emergency shelters and enhanced shelters, that's roughly 10% and 20% respectively in our communities. So the emergency shelters in our communities have of people who exit about 10%, I think it's 9, 9.3%, exit into stable shelters. Whereas in enhanced shelters, it's about 20% exiting. The road to housing's rate of 65% should be objectively viewed as a resounding success. So I would say that if there is a failure of the road to heart parking program, it was not programmatic, but a failure of scale. Because the program provided no more than 50 parking spaces at any time for roughly 2,000 vehicle residents in Seattle, it could not show a visible reduction in the total number of people who lived in public parking. Uh, these are some of the examples of other parking programs. This is the Kirkland United Methodist program. We have the. Uh, coordinator of that here, uh, as well as uh, other programs throughout the county. So without legal space to live, vehicle residents have turned to protest encampments where they can occupy public and private space as a stated political act. And I documented these encampments and their banishment on several occasions. From the relocation of the Bangarang Village in North Lake Way, as I discussed earlier in 2015, the eviction of the communities under the West Seattle Bridge and Camp Sanctuary in 2017, and the closure of Camp Second Chance in West Seattle in 2018. When these encampments are evicted, their members typically move to nearby streets until they find another safe space, safe local space. And again, I would look at, we'll talk about this later. <coughs> so, this brings back to the second breach question. What can vehicle residency tell us about mobile sheltering patterns and vice versa? So this offers the opportunity for analogy. When we can understand more about how we relate to our objects and our material cultures, we call that, in the present, through understanding how we related to them in the past and vice versa. Once, one of the strengths of archaeology is that ability to provide analogy and inference across space and time. Through this analogy and inference, we can better understand how and why people use mobile sheltering in public parking of Seattle by comparisons with other forms of mobile sheltering. Conversely, this study of contemporary vehicle residency can inform our archaeological understanding of what is generally considered nomadism. So I want to show a couple of similarities. This is kind of interesting. This is uh, Dale Farm. Has anybody ever heard of Dale Farm? I'm not surprised. And that's not a very well-known figure. It's actually very famous if you're in the UK. A lot of people, British people know Dale Farm. Uh, 1999, uh, the travelers who I mentioned before, the travelers are still around, about 40,000 travelers in the UK and Ireland. Uh, travelers in, the, in Essex, uh, in Dale Farm, moved from this one, this was a property that the travelers owned, they had a scrap yard next to it. You can see here, you can see the uh, mobile home park with buildings that they built around. And they started to move into the scrap yard next door. By 2011, they had completely moved into the scrapyard, had moved all the scrap out, and had built permanent uh, structures and houses in here. Well, the community neighbors in these lots around began complaining, and in, later that year, 2011, these kids out public went in and destroyed the new place. Um, all this deformation that you see here was them creating berms. They actually raised the land so that nobody could come in and put houses in here again. What I think is particularly interesting on this picture is if you notice where all the RVs went. <laughs> right along the street outside. And again, when we consider this about the evictions of vehicle residency in Canvas in Seattle, we see this as nearly identical. But this isn't restricted just to travelers. Roma people in 2016 living in apartments were evicted as nomads. Think about that, right? <laughs> These are people who are settled but have been declared as nomads and been kicked out of this program. Uh, in uh, 2016 as well, uh, a, a fire in a, in a caravan killed 10 people, uh, travelers in Ireland. Uh, again, this was because of the lack of scale. This is because these sites were overloaded with people because there were so many people looking for a space. 
And instead of pushing displaced people from our settled communities, we should look at ways that can help pull displaced people into spaces where they can settle if they want and connect with their surrounding society. One long practice response are called halting sites, constructed from the, in the British Isles started in the 1970s. These sites provide legal long-term parking space for mobile homes, a shelter that was originally intended for storage. Uh, you see them for them. They were originally intended for storage, but people quickly moved into as permanent housing. Again, showing people are looking for housing. And I should mention at this point, because I didn't mention this before, recent all-home studies show that vehicle, all, the vehicle residents in Seattle, 93% reported that they would move into permanent housing immediately if it was made available. Right, so we, should, again, should push back on this idea that this is somehow inherent wanderlust or nomadism. These are people who want, primarily want to sell. And these sites, um, uh, they also provided hygiene facilities, electricity, and water. And according to a 2008 uh, UK report on their national halting site system, they have these all across the country, the two primary challenges to the halting sites came from uh, 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 issues uh, with the, the settled community and the lack of scale of these sites to actually meet the need. And if we continue this comparison of the displaced travelers with vehicle residents in the United States, we may reach a disturbing conclusion. After 400 years of displacement, social isolation, marginalization, and then subsequent intermarriage, because they couldn't marry outside of uh, the traveler community, the Irish travelers have become a distinct culture of intergenerational poverty. So much so that in 2017, travelers' rights advocates successfully lobbied for their declaration uh, as a distinct ethnic group in Ireland. Although they were descended from the same people, DNA tests showed that the travelers were as genetically distinct from their Irish neighbors as the Irish were from the Spanish. And that's because of the intermarriage and <clears throat> social isolation. After centuries of historic and current social bias and exclusion, the UK and Irish governments have struggled for decades to settle travelers into local communities while respecting their long-term nomadic traditions. So what can vehicle residency tell us about this? As internally displaced people, vehicle residents are typically raised with sedentary ideals and move based on environmental forces. Contemporary vehicle residency is thus an adaptive behavior to this persistent force of displacement. Like many, vehicle, like many people before them, mobile sheltering, such as in tents or makeshift shelters or in vehicles, is an adaptive strategy of resistance and resilience to forces of displacement. In contemporary and archaeological record, I suggest that presence of mobile sheltering may be an indicator of social environmental displacement rather than the traditional paradigm of peripatetic nomadism that says that people are moving around just to seek resources. In other words, when we see mobile sheltering in the past and present, we should consider the natural and human-made environmental forces of displacement that compel these behaviors as optimum, rather than dismissing mobility as simply fueled by wanderlust. <clears throat> So this brings to question two, I'm wrapping up, I'm almost done. Uh, vehicle resident, uh, Robin McVeigh again suggested that anti-nomadism is a tool of the sedentarist hegemony that reinforces the settled practices as ideals and nomadic behaviors as an existential threat. This implicit and explicit bias towards so-called nomadic people has been documented throughout the world for millennia, as shown by anthropologist Anatoly Kazanov, international lawyer Marco Moretti, and the social theorist Giles Deleuze, I'm always, I'm always horrible with this first name. Same, how do you pronounce Deleuze's first name? Maybe no? Okay, I'm going to butcher it anyway. Giles Deleuze and uh, Felix Botari. Um, however, I argue that Robbie McVeigh's description of structural violence as anti-nomadism is too vague. I observed a particular process through which displacement is dismissed and normalized. This systemic bias virtually ensures that social disaffiliation and criminalization of perceived nomads. So my dissertation investigates how this bias against nomadic practices is constructed as inherently foreign and diseased. I refer to this as a nomadic pathology and show how it is used to identify people as a social other, to socially isolate populations and reinforce this social othering. 
My theory is that the bias in nomadic pathology by settled communities is used to justify otherwise unconscionable acts of violence, displacement, social alienation, and criminalization of poor and vulnerable people. Nomadic pathology can influence settled communities to immediately presume that displaced people are foreign threats of crime, mental illness, and drug addiction, rather than neighbors who lost their jobs and homes. Because their nomadic behavior is diagnosed as unhealthy and outside the familiar, <coughs> the elimination of nomadic practices and their practitioners is socially and legally justified as a response to this existential and public health threat. <coughs> Thus, the bias of nomadic pathology provides the moral justification for immoral acts against displaced people. However, nomadic pathology is a social construct that, like all social constructs, can be changed, can be remade and removed. We are not destined to repeat our mistakes simply because that's how it's always been done. To conclude, I hope to apply this research and, and theory to practice in hope that this praxis may improve the lives of, pe of the vehicle residents I met. It's really simple. Including vehicle residents into emergency shelter, local emergency shelter systems means a paradigm shift of recognizing the value of the vehicle homes to their inhabitants. Moreover, it means acknowledging that people will not abandon their legally registered property for an overnight shelter bed. Including over half of the people who sleep in, their pub in public space in Seattle means providing a space for their home so that our displaced neighbors can safely use their existing shelters to transition into permanent housing if that is their wish. We need to end our policies of pushing displaced people from our communities and find ways to pull folks into st who seek stability into services that can focus on settlement. The model of halting sites is one example of how this positive pull into stability can help reduce the habitation of pu public space and include people in established service systems. Seattle and other communities can learn from the decades of developing and managing these sites to include vehicles as shelters in our emergency shelter system. In summary, with off-street space, hygiene facilities, as well as community and social service support, vehicle homes can become a new stock of transitional shelter beds for people who seek permanent housing. Amen. All, of this leads, <laughs> all of this leads to a final hypothesis, which I hope to investigate in further doctoral and academic research. My hypothesis is, this is the final slide, if policies are not enacted to stabilize vehicle residents before, during, and after they are displaced, we may be witnessing the origin of an, emer of the origin of an emergent culture of a new American traveler. Mm -hmm. As individuals respond to displacement in the U.S. with vehicle residency, this new form of affordable housing is becoming popularized. There are a growing number of YouTube video stars using the hashtag van life who receive product endorsements and document how to live this alternative lifestyle. While some van lifers uh, began their travels specifically to make these videos, most start their vehicle residency in response to initial dispossession or displacement. Again, vehicle residency is less a story of homelessness than an adaptive response to environmental displacement. I want to thank everybody for coming today. I also have a flyer that I want to hand out to, so that actually it's pretty neat. It, it doesn't, it's not printed the best, uh, but if you can try to struggle through reading, it's really, really great. Thank you, Bill. Uh, this is a cartoon that was made about hashtag their life, uh, which is actually really interesting, made by a person who lives in their van. Uh, it's actually called Van Life Isn't Just White Couples. <laughs> Young white. So I'd love to open up the room for questions, and also if you're on the Facebook Live, if you would like to ask questions, please do so, and we'll have one of our great people up right here, here uh, pass them on. I saw a question. Hand over here first. Yes. Uh, by the way, thank you so much for the moving and great understanding of our society in a very contemporary way. It's just uh, coming from a different department, this means a lot. Um, Thank you very much. But I wanted to ask, as you carried on this research, what what training did you have that allowed you to conduct it in an ethical way? Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the process to be approved by the Institutional Review Board? Yeah, so I, uh, so I did uh, 
seek institutional review re board approval on my undergraduate and graduate work, and was actually uh, uh, received a deferral on both because I uh, don't do direct, I, my research was in public, looking at public occupation of space, and it wasn't doing experimental research with individuals. So that was the reason why it was, uh, they gave a waiver for that. Um, but I worked uh, very closely with uh, my professors in the Department of Anthropology, uh, particularly Rachel Chapman, actually, who early on is here. Uh, uh, as an undergraduate, I started this research as an honors thesis, and we spent a lot of time looking at the ethics of this. Uh, and I would say that when I moved into an RV, it was a bad call. Uh, one of the things that I learned very quickly is that I, that did not represent living in a vehicle. Uh, and some of the things, though, it, it was able to show me what it meant to get tickets living in a vehicle and what it meant for me being in there. So that it opened up other ways. But that was one of the ways um, I constantly was working with vehicle residents, with advocates, uh, with my professors to review my work and uh, check it for, for ethics so they make sure I was perfectly aligned. Thank you. Yes? Do, do you have an idea of the percentage of people? who are construction workers, but in other words, boomers is a slang term that move from place to place. And because they get, I have a friend of mine that's a welder and he would get per diem and either he could stay in a hotel or his other guys would stay in an RV and get the per diem and get to keep it. Yeah, unfortunately I don't have a percentage on the number of people that are moving from place to place um, working while living in their vehicles. It's a, a difficult, Step to get, but I will say that at least anecdotally, when I began this research, many of the people that I was working with, working with, were exactly in that position. In fact, that's why I started this work was that I was um, many. Of, I was a bartender at the time, and many of the customers I had were people who were working in shipbuilding or fisher, uh, the fishing industry, and would live in their vehicles either when they came back from being at sea or you know when they were off shift and. Uh, particularly in Ballard, that was one of the interesting things I saw, is Ballard has this long history of that. And so when um, vehicle residency started to rise in the 2010 time, 2011, uh, I think Ballard was one of the interesting places that was more receptive to, than others because it had this history of people living in vehicles on the streets that connect the fishing industry. It doesn't directly answer your question, but I didn't know. No, no, I, I just think, like in the Midwest, I've seen it, and like they have the at campgrounds um, mm -hmm. and I've talked to people who mm -hmm. you know are siding do siding in the summer mm -hmm. and they move from small town to small town doing their siding job it, it, it is interesting to note too that in Seattle there are no campgrounds for, for RVs uh, that's a really important point that there are no places whether you have that $50,000 RV or the $5,000 RV, RV there are no actual RV campgrounds in Seattle so you have to go outside of Seattle and that's one of the reasons why you see the $50,000 RV parked in Soto, <laughs> because that's the only legal place for it. Yes, Sally. I'm wondering, I, I can see kind of the tension between um, the uh, referring to the vehicle residents as becoming almost a nomadic culture when they're not really nomads, and and referring to that, you know, the, the Irish travelers, the Roma, etc. cetera, um, it may, at least with the older generation, may think back to the hobos um, who traveled around and were not well thought of even during the depression when uh, how could you not be if you didn't, you know? Um, so I, I, and I'm wondering if some um, vehicle residents might also, um, after their horrible experience with, you know, uh, most of civilization turning on them and saying you're bad people, um, become even more of a culture. I mean, how, how do you see that that kind of tension where um, supposedly um, municipalities, et cetera, um, thinking of one particular Seattle city council member said, we've got to get people out of their cars. On the one hand, of course, we would like to get them out of their cars, and in, but I wonder if they would just like them to go somewhere. Yeah. You know, they well, want I, to get rid of the vehicles and they don't see them as as shelters. That's right. And I think that's exactly what I'm referring to in my nomadic pathology is what I'm trying to yeah. say there is that that's, there's this bias, even among advocates and people who do this research too, that immediately yeah. see these vehicles as a source of disease and foreign threat. And I think that that, um, that has been going on for a long time. And that the, the travelers and, the, and the, the research from the 1970s and 60s yeah. and 30s about this. this terminology can just kind of feed into 
you know, discrimination. Yeah, I think it's fascinating to see how how um, how consistent this discrimination is across cultures and across time. And that's really what was, I think, what, what particularly interested me here, was that the more that I looked into other cultures of mobile sheltering, the more I saw these exact forms of dis discrimination played out over and over again. And really, the same kind of ways of people occupying their space and using their materials around them. And, and I, I, I found that, um, that there was something, something there, you know, that there was something deeper going on there. And that's, that's why I focused on the magic pathology. Uh, I'm going to go to. Pete Knudsen, my first anthropology <laughs> professor. <laughs> this was great. Um, you know, of course, I'm from Ballard and Fisherman's Terminal mm -hmm. and grew up in the marine industry. Mm -hmm. And so right away, my head was spinning off because uh, so much of the marine industry is, is, is uh, uh, nomadism, I guess, in a way, when you come back and go fishing. But, but I think there's also a class element. I don't think it's just purely nomadism because, for example, Shill Shoal Marina is run by the Port of Seattle. Those are yachts, expensive sailboats. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've also got private marinas. That's okay. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years ago, the port tries to ban fishermen from living on their on their vessels, the right. fishermen's terminal. Yeah. You know, so I think it's I think it's nomadism plus class. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And um, and I, I think it's um, Robin McVeigh talks about this in an interesting way. He says that um, that that sedentarism predates classism, racism, all of this, because it, you can see it in cultures that, that, that are doing it against themselves. And, and it's, it's interesting, I, but, but I think you're right, that I think that as classism has come in, maybe, that, it, it, that, that, that this nomadic pathology is used to say, you're not part of our group, right? It's a way to, to socially other, other people. And I think that's part of it, is that, you know, the person living in the yacht may not see themselves as nomadic, right? And that's kind of the whole point. It's, it's somebody else saying, you're a nomad and you're bad because of it. Well, who says you're a nomad, right? And that's, I, I think you're right, classism comes along. Uh, Jenny, do we have um, a question from the Facebook? Yes, we have a question from the Facebook. And who's it from? From Aaron Rance. Aaron Rand. Oh, Aaron, Aaron. So I will mention briefly. Aaron uh, was our uh, road to housing uh, case manager and who worked as a case manager in the program. Aaron. Aaron says it's worked out for people experiencing homelessness in some places to organize as a group and advocate for better resources and against harassment. Do you think this could work for vehicle residents? <clears throat> Absolutely. I think that uh, I think that they have to. I think that we have to. Um, I think that. Uh, I think that there, that there needs to be the advocacy for vehicle residents, that that's one of the main reasons why we don't see the work that's being done. Uh, that uh, I, one of the things I think that, one of the reasons why we have the problem that we have is that around the lack of funding, uh, a lack of support for vehicle residents is that there is not a funding stream. There is not a funder out there who says that vehicle residency is a big issue. Um, we do have that same for veterans, for youth and young adults, for families. But no one's really ever stepped up to say that vehicle residency should be the top priority, even though it's over half the people living on the streets. Um, so I think that, that there needs to be advocacy. And, it, and, it, and it absolutely, I think self-organization is a huge part of that. But I think that the rest of us also in this room and, and elsewhere can help to be part of that, that we need to be able to lend our voices to this community to say, you know, our neighbors need space where they can help to stabilize. Right? Our neighbors who want to be part of our society right, need a place where they can help to connect. Uh, Josh. Uh, thank you very much for all you're doing. Um, I was struck by the 31 million-ish to the 350,000-ish uh, versus you know, car. People living in cars get $350,000. If you're not in a car, you get $31 million. Different mm -hmm. pool to choose from. Clearly, clearly, there's some overlap there, I'm assuming. Um, ask, can you unpack that a little bit because um, it, it would speak to the stuff that makes systems move in the world we live in. You yeah. know, how, you know, if you're getting a few people out, it, how much does it cost? Can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, so the $31 million is specifically, to my knowledge, is specifically the amount spent on emergency shelters only. Uh, I believe I was going to ask Melissa if she's still here, but I think she might have stepped out. Uh, that the uh, the emergency that the total uh, uh, 
budget on services around homelessness in Seattle in King County is around 170 million. Um, yeah, they said, they said higher. I think it all depends on the you're numbers. You're describing the money yeah. that nonprofits get. Yeah, you know, it depends million. on how you kind of grab the particular number out. But it's a, a much larger pool that's kind of applied to all sorts of services from housing and employment services and food. But specifically, 31 million is what's spent on the actual emergency shelters. And then 350,000 is what has been allotted in the past for safe parking. This year, uh, the, that is $250,000 to start another pilot. Wow. Which kind of boggles my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and that really hasn't been planned yet. I mean, well, there's there's work on it. I'm actually working with some of those people, so there, I, I I hope that it actually does end up very well. So fingers crossed. Yes. Uh, Michael Bryan brings this out now and then. Yes, he does. Michael Bryan uh, definitely does, does a lot of work on this. And I appreciate the work he does. Catherine. Yes, I wanted to ask you something more academic, but I'm really yes. curious about the the photo of the family that was willing to pay five hundred dollars for a parking space. Yeah. Is that happening? Is there kind of a sub um, market for people renting out parking spaces? Is that legal? Is that like a considered an ADU, or is like what? Where does that fit in? It's not. Legal. It's not legal. Um, it, it generally it means it's an it's. Sometimes people are able to fly below the radar and be able to get away with it. Uh, it generally is, is illegal, and people do get in trouble for it every once in a while. And you see people that they come, the city will come and tow an RV off someone's front driveway even with someone living in it. Property. Yeah, because it's, even though it's private property, it's because you're uh, you're adding an extent uh, an extra living unit, which to an unzoned piece of land for that. Uh, but there is are considerable amount of people who do that, who are looking for places either within the city or outside the city. There's also, I, I took out some of the photos because we didn't have enough time, but uh, there's a, a very complex um, economy around vehicle residencies of people purchasing vehicles from auctions, uh, school bus auctions or uh, uh, impound auctions, and then retrofitting the vehicles and selling them back to people who are living on the streets. Right now, the because of this increasing wave of, of tickets and impounds, uh, two years ago, the, in, the, the impound lots would have auctions once every month in either North or South Seattle, okay? Now, it's every single week in both North and South Seattle, and the going rate on auction of RVs is $1. Because there are so many of them, they can't get rid of them. And if you go to these auctions, no kidding, you will see RVs and then coming around and saying, who wants it, can you just take it? Right, and they and, and I I have photographs of the inside of these RVs, and they're filled with with possessions. I mean, it's IDs, it's it's stuff. You know, I have you know, this is my ID for finding my lost child. You know, I mean, it, it's it's horrible to see this these things people lose. It's got a whole bunch of questions came up. Aqua, I'm going to go with you first. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to expand really briefly on the question. Uh, something that's come up and become actually really common recently in the Seattle area, in particular, because of the high levels of displacement we've seen, is a. a a pattern of predation amongst people that have resources to offer them to these people, where they'll they'll give you the deal of a lifetime. They'll say, I'll rent you an RV or an RV space, either way, and I'll rent it to you for less than the going rate. Let's say $250 to $300 is, is fairly common, but up to $1,000. So they know when they're renting it that they're going to rent this, this RV to these people and then have it towed because they own the vehicle and they have all of the, all of the requisite paperwork to uh, bring that about. And they're doing this multiple times a month with the same RV. They can rent the same RV for a month yeah. 10 times if they get it towed every couple of days. And I personally know half a dozen people uh, that that has happened to in the Seattle area just over the last year and a half. So it's, it's people are adapting to the, the suffering of others in a way that is uh, capitalist, capitalistically beneficial. And, and I want to add on that. That has become so pervasive in LA that Los Angeles passed a law just a couple months ago uh, that against people renting out RVs as apartments. Because there's been so many people who've been buying RVs and renting them out to people on the streets as apartments and creating these new forms of housing. So we're talking about this as a new forms of affordable housing. I mean, it really absolutely is affordable for people. Dan. Uh, when uh, the vehicle is impounded uh, and auctioned off, does that relieve the 
the owner of all those liabilities and yep. starts fresh? That's a good question. Uh, yes, it does. So once the once, to my knowledge, uh, once the vehicle has been impounded uh, and is sold, it's, it it goes under a new uh, bill of sale. So it all kind of starts over new. It does not absolve the owner of the existing fees, right? So if they had tickets, they're still going to be liable. And this is one of the things to keep in mind: how this may how this may affect uh, people's ability to get into housing, right? Because these impounds, and then because the in, just because the vehicle's been impounded, once it's impounded, there's a storage fee, right? Which is often two hundred dollars a day for RVs, right? So that can get up into the thousands of dollars very quickly, and that 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 cost never goes away. It ends up going to collections and destroys people's credit, which nowadays people get credit checks when they go to look for apartments or even jobs. So this can actually help uh, to hinder people's ability to get into housing and employment. Um, and I want to recognize, we, so at five minutes until 4.30, we're going to do something kind of special. Uh, I'm going to do a few more questions, but one of the things that's helped me to get through this work and the secondary traumas of experiencing this has been the wonderful support of my band. Uh, who's in the back of the room looking pretty sinister. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're going to come up at, uh, at, at five minutes to 4.30 and we're going to play a little song for you about vehicle residency. So we'll go for the last couple questions. Uh, I'm going to go with Jean. Yeah, uh, there's been quite a proliferation of these tiny house villages. They're very popular. I don't see much difference between an RV and a tiny house. What advice would you give to the city as they roll out this quarter million dollar program, this new pilot, as to how to manage this? You know, I have a lot of uh, mixed feelings about tiny houses. Um, and uh, so my opinion of it is this. And this is, this is the same reason why I would not describe myself as an advocate for vehicle residency. I think people should have permanent space. People should have all, everybody should Housing should be a right, yeah. right? And I think that we should not be creating a new system of haves and have-nots, where either you get access to good housing or you get a shack in the backyard. Now, at the same time, I recognize that we have a considerable problem with housing affordability and housing unavailability. So I think it's a very difficult issue, and it's very similar to vehicle residency. In the, in the, in, in the interim, we have to provide this immediate relief. People need a space to be. But in the long term of development, do we really want to create a system yeah. in which certain people get normal traditional housing and then people who are too poor just get to live in shacks and bedrooms? I'm talking about tiny houses, which are temporary only. Yeah. Temporary well, as temporary spaces, I think that, that it's great that we, we look at them as temporary spaces and that we try to, uh, I think that we, we want to resource them very much the way that we talk about the halting sites, is that we, they need to be provided with the uh, hygiene facilities, the electricity, the water, the spaces where people, as spaces where people can help to stabilize. And um, the, the, cons the key, based on my experience in the Road to Housing program, is that there needs to be this connection with the social services. That if you're building these, just like the, the Road to Housing program, if you're building these parking spaces or the tiny houses outside the service system, then you're reinventing the wheel. There's $170 million going to help end homelessness in our community. Why would you create new housing outside of that $170 million? Right? So this is why, and I would say that's one of the critiques of the Road to Housing program, to be honest, was that it really wasn't built inside the system very well. And that's why, why the new pilot that we're talking about actually is integrating directly into the system. Bill. Um, there were several things implicit in what you said um, that all align with person-centered, which is the buzzword from the system. Uh, one was identity, one was uh, trauma, and the other is exile from our friends at Seattle U. Those are good words for you to, to flesh out more because they're inherent about this separate community identity, the way we're separating people and, and isolating them, uh, forming a stronger relationship that is Lake Washington built on relationship building, but you can also lose your identity to that sedentary community that you want to live in again. Right. So those would be good words because they speak to elected leaders in a ways right now, they're clueless. Right, right. Absolutely. They're really clueless. That's right, and, and I, I think that's a really good point. I, it reminds me of this, this conversation we I got back from the American Anthropology Association was talking about this with other people, and, and this conversation came up about uh, uh, the, the idea of, of the term migrant or homeless um, and about how, you know, I kind of said, why well, we should be pushing back on these terms? Because it seems that if we call someone homeless, it 
how do you become homed if you're homeless? Right, that this, this identifying person by this impossible metric that you can never meet, how do you become settled if you're a migrant? Right, and that, and that, that we need to push back on that language to see how do we, how, you, how do we um, imagine new you know, settlement at the end of this process? Yeah. Because should, you know, it seems that we start these conversations from the point of let's build up to show why this is a human being. Well, let's start from the point that this is a human being, right? We don't need to, I don't need to prove to you that this is a human being. This is a human being. So let's move forward. And what does it need? What, what do we need? Not they. What do we need to survive, right? Because they are we, and we're all in this together. Yeah. And so. those first steps into housing, they bring that trauma with them. Absolutely, they do. Rachel? Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you so much. It's so exciting to be here watching this. And as always, you are one of the, and you should not be afraid to party people. Actually, you put so much time on this. So props to that. <laughs> I, don't, I know that you're doing this on, you are always working on multiple levels. So I'm going to assume that I don't even know half the ones that you're working on because of your work and where you want to apply this. But as an anthropologist, can we go back to your last conclusion? Mm -hmm. You surprised me where you ended, and that was analytically for me. Mm -hmm. How did you get there? Can you just go back to your yeah. last slide and say your last? I sure can. This is where Thank you for asking. Moving. Yes, oh, the hypothesis? Is this what you're talking about or the one no, before this? No, your end. Oh, yes, okay. Therefore, this the, is not about homelessness. This oh, is yes. Uh, so that, uh, I think it was that. This is not that vehicle residency is not a, a is not a tale of homelessness as much as a tale of displacement. Yes, that's what I'm saying. I think in the, the final one. So yeah, this I, is where it was actually. I want to go to the to the meta analysis and hope that you'll be willing to take another at another level. Yeah. You started out in England with the um, travelers. But you even went before that. You went to primitive accumulation. Right. And you yeah. You said in order to get cheap workers at a time when workers are rebelling, you have to displace them from the land and enclose. That's right. So you read with me, maybe Sylvia Federici critiqued Marx and says, I agree that that had to happen for the beginning at the beginning of capitalism, but I disagree that it only happened once. Yeah. It happens every time there is a crisis. Which means we are at a moment of such a crisis of capital that we need workers who not only have to be in the streets, they have to produce their own living out of thin air. But we're still going to take their labor. That's right. And you mentioned people who need to, I thought we were going to be in the lab. You mentioned that people are in the encampments to work at Amazon. Right. How could you possibly in Seattle come to the end and not say one of the things that needs to happen is Amazon needs to pay for <laughs> I agree. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I want to take that one step forward. Amazon needs to be able to employ people who are being displaced from our communities. Okay? We need to, people need to not, and not get displaced. We need to be able to have jobs that are being taken away from us, too. Okay? I think that's part of it. But no, I just, I'm just trying to figure out what is the argument that we're making not to say companies are using the public space in order to house the workers they refuse to pay enough to have housing and not to pay their taxes so that there can be public funding for housing. Right. That seems to be really haunting this whole thing. And so I'm not saying how, what you should argue or what we argue, but if we're not at least saying there is a there is money, it does exist. What do we argue for these people? We've talked a lot about the details, but how do we not get back to where the money at? <laughs> <laughs> but I really mean this. The Polit audience. Politically, economically, where do you end so that those of us who go away to be able better to make the arguments we, we need to in all, at all levels? Yeah. Where do we where do we end? So I, um, and I, I want to say this briefly because we're, we want to get into our music real chance. And I want to talk to you more about this afterwards because I love that response. Thank you so much. It's really great. Um, I, I, I go back to Ibn Khaldun's uh, look at uh, the sort of the, the cycle of civilization. And Ibn Khaldun had said that we started this at this, in 1377, for those who don't know who Ibn Khaldun was, he had said that, uh, that we started this sort of base level of, of nomadism and the 
crisis in this environment, in this catastrophic environment, and that we build up our civilizations to help buffer us from this, this catastrophic environment that never really goes away. We just develop this myth of safety that they were buffered from it, and and that he says that over time that begins to decay. That because the environmental catastrophe never goes away, it starts to break away into settling yeah. stability, stability, and then things start to go on that downturn slide. I wonder if what we're seeing here, and this part of it is Amazon turning towards displacing people to become part of this labor force, that this larger displacement and this turn towards a nomadic turn is an example of what even Hubbard was talking about is that, that decay of the civilization, right? As the, as the civilization is going back into that nomadic state, uh, back to its original. Right? So I think that, that there's, it's, that's a very concerning thing. Um, because that's kind of what I'm hitting at about this possible nomadic turn where we could be going. Um, that that the forces of Amazon are, are doing much to help to actually destabilize our economy and our society. As our as is climate change. As is climate change and many other forces. I want to talk to you more because I see you have a lot of a lot of comments. Okay, I'm going to do one last quick question. Uh, I think because I saw this back here. I did it too. Yes, please. Uh, so um, I'm not an anthropologist. I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm a geographer, so we are interested in many of the same sorts of things. And what was really coming through in a lot of what you said, and I love your language, things like islands of safety and sea of restriction, and a lot of talk about public uh, property and its juxtaposition with private property. And I think you really hit on something here because the street parking is the front line of where public and private property meet. Mm -hmm. And so it's a particularly rich intersection for that reason, especially because the people with the private property, they actually see that space in front of their home as That's theirs right. when it isn't, That's which right. is an extension of all sorts of hegemonic thinking, right? <laughs> so I, it's not really a question so much as to say that all of your work you could carry on, put another slide on the end for, say, my audience. <laughs> and uh, you made a great claim here for how uh, vehicle residency is actually on the vanguard and pushing the edge of our understanding of this juxtaposition between public and private property, which is exactly what Amazon is taking advantage of, right? So it's really terrific work. Thank you. Thank you. I want to give one last time, because I think you had a question in the very back. Mm -hmm. You did? Okay, good. All right, everybody, thank you guys for coming. I'm going to do, we're going to have a nice little treat for you all. We're going to play a song. Um, this song was written about six years ago when I started doing this research. This is called A Home Without a Home. And it is dedicated, we dedicate this to uh, everybody who lives in their vehicles. This is our wonderful band. I have actually one built into this. Yeah. Um, this is a wonderful band. I want to introduce them real quick. This is Tom over here on the bass. Tom Steffens is uh, should be playing that beautiful band. Uh, Elliot here is being back, uh, helping, or, in, in, including on vocals. Uh, Corey over here is playing the squeezy box uh, accordion, and Kurt is uh, going to be playing the drums, probably about as quiet as possible. Sure. <laughs> 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 we're going to see if we can't do this. They're all. Uh, Where should I stand? I'm going to stand right here. There we go. No, we're good. We're good. Okay. We're good. So hopefully, hopefully this will work. Thank you.